All right, it looks like we are live. I am so sorry about all of that commotion and wait and waiting. I'm so excited that you all stuck around for this. Um, this is a new link and I hope that you can click on it. Alrighty, hi everyone. Oh no, it says private. Why does it say private? Okay, so let's see why, 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 why. Oh, how can I get that? Okay, let's try this again. I want to make sure that this is not private anymore. This needs to be public. Public. Done. Save. <laughs> All right, everyone. So I'm hoping that you can hear me OK. Um, thank you so much again for waiting and your patience. And again, I'm so sorry for having to redirect you to another link. Um, but with all great programs, right, for all first time great programs, there comes a little bit of technical difficulty. So I'm so excited that you all stuck around for this. We are so excited to get started. And we um, will just give everyone a minute to kind of come into this new link again. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with us. We're so excited to show off and get to dive into Peter Mott's life. So we'll just give everyone a minute or so. All righty, and it looks like the it looks like you all can hear me, which is great. If you can't hear me, please send me a quick chat um, to let me know, and hopefully I can try to fix it. Um, again, thank you so much for tuning in. We really, really appreciate it. All righty. Hi, hello. I'm, I'm waving to everyone virtually. It's so great to see everyone in the chat. Oh, great. I'm so happy to see it's working. Woo! <laughs> All right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Just a few more, few more seconds before we officially get started. Thank you all. All righty, so let's just dive right in and let's get started. Um, my name is Jen Cormier and I am the Visitor Programs Manager at the Seymour Marine Discovery Center at Long Marine Lab. Um, for those of you who have never been to the Seymour Center before or who happen to click on this link because it seemed interesting, the Seymour Center is actually the um, is actually the educational and outreach center for Long Marine Lab. Long Marine Lab is a part of University of California Santa Cruz, UCSC, go slugs. Um, and it is just full of the most inspiring, incredible bunch of researchers, scientists, students, PhD candidates, faculty members, administrators who work so hard to study the ocean and who really try to make the world a better place in little old Santa Cruz. And we are super lucky to be in their education and outreach center. And so before we dive into all the fanfare and excitement of today's conversation, I do have a couple of thank yous right at the top, a little bit of fanfare. Um, a little bit of singing of praises. And so I um, just want to say thank you to everyone who is tuning in today. Um, I also want to say a big, big thank you to all of the Seymour Center supporters, volunteers, donors, members who have just shown us such incredible support during this time of social distancing. You are all just blowing our socks off. You are all the best. So thank you so, so, so much. 
Additionally, I want to say thank you to everyone who has submitted questions um, uh, to for me to ask Peter. Uh, so thank you all for submitting questions in advance. Um, I will try to get to all of them, but boy, did you submit a lot. So again, we'll try to get to all of them. Um, but during the conversation, if you think of a question that you want answered, go ahead and type it in the chat and hopefully we'll be able to get to it uh, during the conversation today. And so without, um, you know, without further ado, let's just get right back to business. Um, so today I have the ultimate privilege of talking to one of the coolest and really one of the best people that I know. He, um, this person, you know, gets to hang out with sharks and invertebrates and fish all day long. He gets to work around and let's be honest, probably in the gurgling exhibit filled with seawater and he gets unlimited access to the uh, behind the scenes areas of the Seymour Center and Long Marine Lab. And we're doing this lab side chat today because we are so, um, we are just so committed and we just really want to continue to show folks in a virtual new world, the role that scientific research plays in the conservation of the world's oceans. So um, thanks for sticking with us, but Today, we are talking to the Seymour Center's aquarium curator, Peter Mott. So let's see if we can get Peter in here so we can start the party um, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll get him in here. Sweet. Peter, you're here. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, this is so excellent. Hi, how are you? Good. Technology's fun. Technology is so fun, you know, it helps us in so many ways and it requires us to learn lots of new things. Sure. Um, <laughs> and, but we're here, we're rolling, we're live, uh, people are asking questions. So um, it, it's really, really good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks so much for having me uh, on today. It, it's an honor to be the first one to you, join you. Yes. Amazing. Yes, you, it is amazing. We are so happy to have you as the first one too, because I don't know if you heard this in my intro, but I honestly think you're one of the coolest and most awesome people I've ever met. Oh, so <laughs> it's so great that we're chatting today. Thanks, Jen. You're yeah. awesome. Yeah. So Peter, where I mean, are for the intro? So um... <laughs> yeah. So Peter, where are you? Oh, I am in the awesome Marine Discovery Center, the Seymour Marine Discovery Center, perched here in front of our Chrysal tank, which is our jelly tank uh, that has sea nettles in it right now. Sea nettles, that's, yeah. that's, that's awesome. And so it looks like that whole exhibit is, it looks round, which is really different than the exhibit that's next to it. Why, why is that one round? This one's round because jellies really do better in a round tank, something with curved sides in it. There are some exceptions to that, but you know, for the most part, these guys have these long tentacles and these, you know, relatively delicate gelatinous bodies and mm -hmm. keeping them in a tank with rounded edges and then providing a current, in this case, uh, the current's going this way and they're swimming against it. So it's, it's going counterclockwise and they're swimming against that current. It keeps them up and off the bottom and swimming mm -hmm. out of the corners uh, where they can get stuck and torn. Yeah, we don't want any jelly bunches right at the corners, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm healthy and happy. Yeah, exactly. And so when we're at the Seymour Center, usually I get the question like, you know, jellies don't have a brain, they don't have eyes, they don't have blood or hearts, and like, but what is been a jelly? But they've been on the planet much longer than we have. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. They've been here for, you know, millions and millions of years, and they're so successful. And so what, what makes up a jelly? And so what is the, what is the actual makeup of it? It's mostly water. Isn't that oh. amazing? <laughs> 
mostly water. Um, there is a, a, a like a nerve net that connects to little ganglia, little nerve clusters around mm -hmm. the around the edges of the bell that mm -hmm. help coordinate the pulsing of the body, the contraction of the body to create propulsion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then most jellies have these wonderful things, these stinging cells called nitocytes, mm -hmm. and, and which have mattises or harpoons in them, and they can sting their prey and immobilize their prey with that. So that's a really cool, you know, attribute of yeah. a jelly and other cnidarians, like sea anemones. Yeah, that is that's amazing. Um, I could really stare at that jelly exhibit all day long. It's just so mesmerizing. <laughs> It's one of my favorite animals to work with. They're, they're challenging enough, uh, but if, if you just stay on top of it, they take daily care. Uh, if you stay on top of it, you're gonna do well, but you, you have to deal with them each and every day yeah. for sure. Wow, that's incredible. So Peter, you are the Seymour Center's aquarium curator. And I, have gotten so many questions about what a curator is, what a curator does, how do you define a curator? And so if you were at a dinner party, how would you describe what you do? I oversee the fish and invertebrate collection at the Seymour Marine Discovery Center. And a curator in general is somebody who organizes the collection and oversees the care of that collection for the purpose of either education or, or research opportunities. And so here we get to show animals that are found locally in Monterey Bay for the most part. And yeah. hopefully in relationship to some sort of science that's going on at the uh, um, University of California, Santa Cruz. Yeah. That's our thing, we wanna talk about science. Right. And so I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you deliberately design all of these different exhibits to showcase, you know, a potential experiment or research that's happening at Long Marine Lab or UC Santa Cruz, or in a way that's asking folks to ask questions or find their inner scientists. And so can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. So we do try to show animals that are part of a researcher's study, perhaps. I mean, it may have not have been an animal that was in the actual study, but you know, right. in that, we have lots of uh, researchers that go out and study the near shore health forest environment here in Monterey Bay. And so we definitely want to bring in sea urchins, which are a big problem right now. Um, and they're, they're sort of mowing down health forest, which is not a good thing. Uh, but it yeah. is an interesting animal to look at and definitely a, an interesting research subject for those who are studying it. Rockfish or, um, you know, we have rockfish out in the bay that recruit in as larvae into the uh, health canopy. So mm -hmm. if that's missing, there's this connection there. We have a few rockfish on the here. Yeah, wow. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's the rest good. is even though somebody may not be specifically studying one of these animals, they're interesting. And just mm -hmm. to get people to think about what they're seeing, like what is so cool about that animal? Why there's a sea slug, it's got this amazing hood on it that it uses to catch plankton out of the water rather than scraping away at sponges like other sea slugs do. It's like the oddball. It's so and just getting people to look at those animals more closely, slow down, and um, try to figure out what they're what they're seeing. It's part of it's part of the scientific process. Yeah, definitely. So it sounds like you're really encouraging folks through your different exhibits and aquaria that you set up that you're encouraging observation, right? We try to. Yeah. <laughs> great. Great. And so being an aquarium curator, can you describe what a typical day like? looks like for you? Are you coming in in the morning, checking on the different animals, seeing, making sure water's flowing? You know, what, what does a uh, typical day look like? I mean, a, a big part of it is managing that, the care and the health of our animals. So every day, I do rounds at least once, sometimes twice a day to look yeah. at, 
at the animals and see how they're doing, make sure the seawater is flowing, the life support or aeration, fix leaks, talk to uh, my team of aquarists. I have a team of four student aquarists that are oh, yes. students that are, uh, are, are definitely helping me do this on a daily basis. And then I interact with our public because I'm, I'm often in the exhibit hall interacting with the public. Our wonderful volunteers to help educate people who come in the door or I'll work on a project with yeah. my colleagues, sometimes yourself, other educators. Our other, we have another curator that focuses on dry tours. And then there's just some really brilliant people here that are part of Long Marine Lab. Uh, sometimes collaborating with uh, one of the researchers or scientists to try and develop future exhibits. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, it sounds like no two days are really the same. It sounds like you're a man of many hats. Pretty busy. <laughs> Pretty busy. And so did you always know that you wanted to work with marine life and little critters and fish and sharks? You know, I'm, I'm an animal person. But I don't know if it was fish and shark in that first. But I'm really an animal person. I'm just yeah. so thrilled to have this position here. Yeah. I reminded recently that when I was just a pup myself, apparently I was fascinated and, and fixated on drawing little one man submarines, like those <laughs> with a hand crank and also uh, scuba equipment, like in, in, you know, so it started really early, although I didn't realize it back then. <laughs> That's great. And so um, can you tell me a little bit more about what your educational path was to becoming a curator? You know, was there a special course or a special curator class that you took? You know, that what, what did your, what did, you know, you're all sitting in the classroom taking notes. This is how you design and maintain exhibits. No, how did you, how did you become a curator? Well, I think there are, there are some courses now that help you in that pathway. Mm -hmm. I know there's a junior college that they have support in that works on on aquarium science and there's some other opportunities out there. But for me personally, I was a student at UCSC and majored in marine biology. While I was doing that, I was able to obtain an internship down here at Long Marine Lab, working for the education uh, component of Long Marine Lab. There was a small facility there that had an aquarium. So that was amazing. So just having that internship opportunity and learning how to care for these animals. I took some amazing classes at UCSC. Everybody should do it. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, invertebrate zoology is amazing. You think of all these little animals that are, you know, don't even, don't have a backbone, but they make up most of the species on the planet. They're fascinating. Of course, fish. There is this course, health forest ecology. It just comes up field work, doing surveys, diving like at least twice a week. It's, it's amazing. Okay, everybody take help for us ecology. Sorry. Okay, sure. write <laughs> write that down. Invertebrate zoology and kelp forest ecology. Those are the those are awesome courses to take. And so for you know, what advice do you have to give to our aspiring young curators who maybe are, who maybe want to go down this path? What advice do you have for them? I'm sure. Uh, well, try to get involved in maybe your local aquarium facility if you have one. See if there's any volunteer opportunities or internships that you can start. Definitely take courses, depending on how young you are, you know, read up on the things you're interested in. But also try to get some animal handling experience, animal care experience. Because even when I've hired students to students myself, I prefer if they've had experience with fish, you know, before you're paying. But there are lots of transferable skills. So mm -hmm. you could assist in maybe a veterinarian's office or an animal shelter, or, um, or, or a zoo, so a terrestrial animal. Just try to get some experience in that way. 
Yeah, no, that's amazing. So it sounds like just get as, as much experience as you can and get your feet wet with lots of different animal care opportunities. Yeah, until you work in and, and then maybe focus on aquatic animals at some point. Right, Perhaps of course. An aquarist didn't work on them. No, that's really great. And so Peter, how long have you worked with Long Marine Lab and the Seymour Center since you started there as a student? What, oh, how long? Yeah. To reveal my age? Oh, no. <laughs> Answer it how you please. <laughs> you know what? The Seymour Marine Discovery Center is 20 years this year. So I started uh, when we started here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as far as curator position, it's been 20, well, 21 years, maybe, working on my 21st year. Yeah. And being part of Long Marine Lab, uh, you know, the Seymour Center is part of Long Marine Lab. Mm -hmm. so there's a few additional years on top of that. Yeah, that is incredible. I bet you are a man of many stories over your sure. um, awesome career. <laughs> by, by the way, there are animals here that are older than I am. Okay. <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. So this may seem really silly. Um, I don't know if you've heard this. But I was reading an article and seeing some headlines that there is a aquarium, I think it's in Japan right now, who started a program to FaceTime their garden oh, eels. <laughs> I, I tried this all the other day and I couldn't get through. I tried. <laughs> you tried that? But okay, so yeah, they're, 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 you want to tell the story or should I go? Uh, well, I was just saying that they're doing the, this aquarium is doing it because these eels are starting to exhibit some strange behaviors because there's not lots of visitors in the hall anymore. And so I was just curious how the Seymour Center animals are doing during this time of social distancing. Okay. Let me just say something about garden eels. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we need some, um, but we have to have a reason. But they, they, they'll hide in their burrows. They're very shy and they hide in their burrows as a way to protect themselves as a potential predator. And yes, if they're not seeing movement regularly, they're not going to, they're not habituated to seeing people by their tanks anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the thing for Japan. So I just try, I could not get through it. <laughs> um, here, you know what? Our animals are pretty good. We don't have anything that's particularly shy, but with our shark, we do have a shark pool here with some, uh, with a few, sh well, sharks in it. Sorry, extra apples. Um, and we, because it is a touch pool, I do want to make sure that they stay familiar with the touching protocol. We are super safe with this process. And we have the aquarists opening up their pool for regular maintenance and feeding, but definitely continuing in that touching protocol every day. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's, that's how we're maintaining. The other ones, some of these other animals probably don't care if they're looking at <laughs> Gotcha, okay, okay. And so it, thinking about the Seymour Center and all the different animals in there, what is your favorite animal? Can you answer that? Or is that like asking to pick a favorite kid? Like what, what is your animal? I have favorites, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of caring for all of them. So mm -hmm. you can't, but there are some interesting animals here. I mean, we were just talking about squirrel sharks. Mm -hmm. There's one, not in the exhibit hall here, but in a holding area that hatched out here when I was a student. She's about 25 years old now. Don't do the math. Um, Melody, oh, I was talking about the slugs earlier. Melody and Nina, the hooded unibrocker lion thing. It has this amazing hood that it uses to catch food. Actually, my colleague, Kevin Key, did a very sweet pro short video program on it that's posted on our website. You should you can check that out. Okay. Um, <laughs> Oh my God, we got these uh, Pacific spiny lump suckers. A from, lump, a lump sucker? It's like this little fish. It's like the, it's like the smaller, about the size of a golf ball, smaller. 
has a little suction disc apparatus on the base of it made out of uh, part of the pin assembly that helps it stick to rocks. But it's like this little orb with fins and it, it doesn't look like it should really be swimming, but it does. I mean, they're just amazing animals and they don't have to be large. I mean, the small things and small tanks can be so interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So I think we got we got a top three, right? We got the swell shark in the Rocky Reef exhibit, right? Yep. We got the mellow beast and the lump sucker, which sounds like a awesome playground insult. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that's great. That is so great. Oh, and so you were talking a little bit about touching the sharks. And so if somebody has not touched a shark before, what does it feel like? Oh, it's really neat. You know, they have these uh, scale-like projections uh, called dermal denticles <laughs> that run down their body mm -hmm. in a, sort of one direction from head to tail. And so it feels a sort of like a smooth surface. If you touch in one direction, if you come back the other direction, it's really scratchy. Oh, like nice. a rat. Sandpaper. Yeah, yeah, like like sandpaper. That's a really great analogy for sure. I wouldn't go touching a shark in the wild. Let's just be clear. Yes, <laughs> only at the Seymour Marine Discovery Center. Right, or another other facility. Yes. Right, right. Okay. Of course. Uh oh, Peter, could you repeat that? It sounded like you cut out a little bit. Random shark and just. <laughs> mm. My network. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So um, at the Seymour Center, you have to take care of all of these different animals. What exhibits or which animal would you say is the hardest to maintain? Well, well the jellies are challenging, um, but they're also rewarding. I mean, if you get it, it's so more challenging, I think it's. Probably, oh, well, we had some, oh, we had some pipe fish hatch uh, recently. So, well, yeah, it's great. Woo -woo, Friday. That's great. <laughs> they are super challenging to, to grow, though. They have to get through this initial hurdle of eating the right food, responding to the food that we offer. We can offer uh, rotor herds, which are a type of very small invertebrate. Uh, pipe fish. Pipefish are very skinny, long fish with very, very narrow mouths on the end, and they feed by slurping into it. And the food has to be small enough to fit in the mouth to do any good. And in our case, we use brine shrimp larvae, which is uh, kind of nice because we hatch it out every day and we keep it going live when we put it in. And they are able to slurp that up pretty well. I just happen to have a container here. Uh, that my aquarist set aside. They're in there. You can kind of see them. They're about an inch long and about a week. Uh, it's out of focus. There you go. That little long skin thing there. You so how, yeah, I can see them. I hope everyone else that's tuning in can see them too. Um, how, how long are they? They're like, what, the size to the first little digit of your pinky? Yeah, it's about an it's about an inch, two and a half centimeters, about an inch on average. Oh, that is absolutely incredible. And so how long do pipefish live for? This species of bay pipefish, I think, is about, if I'm remembering correctly, it's about four years or so, somewhere in their pocket. Oh, that's so amazing. That's great. And so why are they, and so these bay pikefish, and you said they're long, skinny fish. Where where do they live? Like, why why are they long and skinny? They're long and skinny because they like to uh, live in eelgrass, to hide along the eelgrass. They actually look like the eelgrass, which is a greenish brown grass, well, bright green grass that we have here along our um, coastline. And they, associate with that and hide within the grass. They're also vertical and long and skinny, so the fish sort of hide among the grass and actually sort of behave with the grass. Mm, flow. <laughs> so there's sort of behavioral camouflage going on. 
as well as um, um, coloration like greens and browns that these fish exhibit to match the seagrass. So, yeah. Yeah, so they sound like the ultimate, ultimate camouflagers. Yeah, they're That's all awesome. skinny and you can't see me. Okay. <laughs> so do you have any other animals um, at the Seymour Center that you work with that are also masters at camouflage? Ooh, we have some flatfish that are really good at it. Uh, they, they match the sand, uh, the mm -hmm. tone of the sand, like the coloration of the sand, they blend right in. That is pretty cool. Uh, oh, we have, the, we, we, have, we have decorator crabs, which are pretty amazing. They actually take artifacts from their environment, like pieces of kelp, and place them on their bodies to actually cover themselves with natural objects in order to hide within their environment. So algae or sponges or things like that. So they look like algae and sponges, except with legs moving sometimes. <laughs> that is amazing. Like walking, walking little sponges. Sure. <laughs> Great. Lots of strategies to try to survive in the wild. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I know a common favorite amongst Seymour Center visitors is the red octopus. Oh yeah, masters of the skies. Those yeah. are well. The one we have right now is a little shy, um, but boy, when they get going with the coloration change is bright red, sometimes a mottled appearance to match, you know, their surroundings, whether it's sand or, or red algae or something. Also, they change the texture of their skin. It can be smooth like a rock or prickly looking like a, a you know, branched piece of red algae. Pretty incredible. Wow, that's so great. you are relatively smart. So they're able to change color to blend into their surroundings as well as their texture. And they're incredibly intelligent. And so when I look at this, um, when I look at the red octopus exhibit, it's always like a Where's Waldo game, right? They're always camouflaging or hiding and yeah. very, very hard to find. <laughs> yeah, so how, how do these, how do octopuses change the color of their skin? Like what's going on there? How are they able to reflect all of these different hues? There's, a, there's chromatophores, these uh, cells with pigments in them and they can change the just uh, with these guys, they're opening and closing cells to express the color in that cell. Yeah. That would probably be a good way of saying there's other strategies where the coloration in the cell moves around but let's just say they're 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 managing the cell to express a certain color and so if you do that in a pattern some cells might be red and some cells might be black and depending on if you open them and show them or not on the surface of the skin will depend on whether you're red or or black or something in between pale yeah wow it's I wish I could do that. That'd be who, fun. Yeah, who doesn't, right? Yeah. <laughs> Colors. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. So um, we have all of these incredible animals that are able to camouflage and they're absolutely breathtaking. But what would you say is the most breathtaking, most beautiful, I don't know, maybe even the rarest type of animal that you have worked with or had to maintain while at the Seymour Center? Wow. Um, yep. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, part of it wasn't alive, but that's kind of weird to talk about. We had, I had this opportunity to work with our veterinarian, Dr. David Hopper. Awesome. He's also on the Marine Mammal Branding, part of the Marine Mammal Branding Network in our area. There was a gray whale that had unfortunately been attacked by orcas and uh, was, had washed up, unfortunately, dead. But the stranding network goes out and takes samples of that for analysis. Uh, and in our case, he was able to take a little skin sample of that, which also had parasites that are naturally found on whales. So we 
had an exhibit here, it's amazing, of whale par parasites. In this case, barnacles and whale lice. I mean, that's crazy. Wow. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy. So you got, you got all these things living on this animal externally, uh, you know, it'd be like us having a tick or something on us, except they could be a lot, and it was a lot. And where else are you going to see that? Two marine discovery zone. That was, that was the thought. Wow. And so you said it was kind of like a tick, so does it hurt the whale at all? Yeah, it's living, well, it's living on the skin. The barnacles sort of negotiate a spot on the skin when they, when they settle in as larvae. But the whale is constantly trying to slough off skin to get rid of things that are on its skin or to repair injury. And so the barnacle is constantly negotiating uh, and reestablishing its anchor within the skin of the animal. And then the... Um, uh, I was just talking about particles and lice hanging on with these like hooky legs and kind of feed off of the dead skin that's produced. Yeah, it's a good time if you're if you're a barnacle or a whale lice, a whale is where you want to be because that's that's your only habitat. Yeah, it sounds like a horror movie. It is. It's, <laughs> it's I mean, they're so interesting. It, it gives you the heebie-jeebies a little bit, but. The whale lice. The barnacles were cool. I mean, there's lots of barnacles we have here that live in the inner pile. They're a, it's a type of crustacean, like a crab, except it lives in this calcium carbonate cup uh, and lives life by collecting plankton from the water. I mean, these whale barnacles are doing the same thing just on the nose of the whale. Yes. This is a really huge mobile home. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, a really huge mobile home. I love that. Um, well, that sounds really fantastic. Oh my goodness. And that was a, an exhibit. Were, Nate. Were you? I'm sorry, Peter, can you repeat that, please? You weren't expecting that one, were you? <laughs> I was not. No, I was not expecting that. But I am learning new things every day, which is honestly the best part about being with the Seymour Center. So. <laughs> Me too. Great. And so, Peter, we were able to dive into, you, you know, your becoming a curator, learning about your favorite animals, learning about some interesting tidbits about animals along the way. Um, and it just sounds like you've had an incredible experience at the Seymour Center. So can I ask you, what is the best part of your job? You know, it's, I'm an animal person. I just love working. But I have to say, the people are amazing. There are some brilliant people here. I get to work with or, or nearby brilliant researchers on site here. We have this amazing group of volunteers that help us run this place and educate people. Just almost every day of the year, we're open. Uh, my own, our, our student assistants, our volunteers, they contribute so much. And then they take what they, sometimes they take what they learn here and then use it as a springboard to find, to work on their own career. We have people who have, you know, developed their experience here and their knowledge here and taking that to other institutions worldwide. It's, it's, it's amazing. So that's, that's really fun. Yeah, that's great. And Peter, I do want to share too that some folks who submitted some questions um, in advance so we could discuss during our chat today, um, a lot of them were your old student assistants or yeah. your old or your old colleagues and they wish you their, you know, they send you their best. So <laughs> do we cover the questions yet? You know, we they were worked in. It is <laughs> there was a lot. <laughs> so um, hopefully we were able to cover all the questions today, um, but it's, you know, I like that you're an animal person, but you like the people too. <laughs> they're okay too. <laughs> they're, they're okay too. Oh, that's, that's incredible. Um, so with, um, so Peter, we actually, we did have a really great chat and that is actually all the time that we well, have. Cool. We can talk, I, you know, between you and me, we can talk for hours about this stuff. Um, 
Well, thank you. You know, yeah, and Peter, I didn't know this was possible, but you are even cooler now than I thought before. You are the oh. most awesome person ever. Um, so it's thank cool. you so much. So I don't know if that's true, but thank you. <laughs> no, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for chatting with me. Um, and, you know, this really concludes our program, right? Lab side chats. We want this to be a quick 15, 20 minute conversation with a professional, a researcher, a scientist, a aquarium curator around Long Marine Lab and the Seymour Center. So I just wanna say thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Uh, we are so excited to continue this new, this new lab side chat program. We hope to schedule more chats in the future. Um, so if you haven't already, please go ahead and sign up to receive the Seymour Center's electronic newsletter. You can go ahead and sign up for that newsletter on our website. Our website is um, seymourcenter.ucsc.edu. Um, and while you're there, go check out some of our distance learning resources. That is where you would find the Melaby uh, video that Peter uh, spoke about during our chat today. It's fantastic. I highly, highly recommend it. <laughs> and um, you can also go check out some of our other resources and some of our other programs that are coming up. Um, we hope everyone is staying safe. We hope everyone's staying healthy. We miss you all so much, and we just can't wait to see you again soon. So again, my name is Jen. There's Peter. <laughs> and again, um, just thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Jen. Bye-bye. Bye, Peter.